First Wednesdays is sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council and by the Kellogg Hubbard Library with video production supported by Orca Media. to this talk in Montpelier. Thanks, so nice to see you. So many faces here tonight. Tonight, we are rolling out a new way for you to give feedback about First Wednesday's talks. We're asking you to sign in on the iPad or the Nook that are making their way around the room. You just fill out the form and click Submit, and then you can hand the iPad or the Nook to your neighbor. And those are floating around. And some of you have already done that. Uh, and you can also use your own device to sign in. Uh, the website is on the top of the screen. And we also have the traditional paper sign-in if you prefer to do that. And that's going to make its way around the room as well. If you sign in electronically, you'll receive an email from Vermont Humanities tomorrow asking for your feedback. Your input helps us and the Vermont Humanities Council to choose topics and speakers for these First Wednesday's lectures. You will only receive one email. And signing into the talk tonight will not add your name to any mailing list unless you opt in and ask to be added. So please let me know if you need any help with that sign-in. We would like to thank the Vermont Humanities Council sponsors and library sponsors who have helped bring this lecture series to the library tonight. <coughs> Our statewide underwriters are the Institute of Museum and Library Services to the Vermont Department of Libraries. And this Montpelier series is underwritten by the Peter Gilbert Endowment Fund. Tonight's talk is specifically underwritten by Bear Fund Books, and we appreciate all that you wear. Thank you to Orca Media in the back for taping this program. The video will be available on their website under the First Wednesday series. Information and the brochure for the First Wednesday series are on the table in the hallway outside, along with community input forms, which you're welcome to fill out tonight, or take with you, and fill out later. At this moment, please make sure your, your cell phones are silenced, and a note that the restroom is in the back. Without further ado, I am very happy to welcome our speaker tonight. Thank you. Elon Stobbins is a Lewis Sebring Professor of Humanities, Latin American and Latino Culture at Amherst College, the publisher of Restless Books, and host of NEPR's podcast, In Contrast. The best-selling author of On Borrowed Words, Spanglish, Dictionary Days, and many other books, his work, translated into 20 languages, has been adapted into theater, TV, film, and radio. Please help me in welcoming Elon Stavis. I am thrilled to be here today, uh, together with you. Uh, I am particularly excited because it is an ongoing project, uh, this one of having First Wednesdays in Vermont, and uh, some of us get invited to it. I am in awe and salute the state for this idea of having the, uh, the public library opened up to topics uh, every first day of every first Wednesday of the month. I wish it was done in other parts of the country as well, uh, at a time when reading and uh, culture in general are uh, besieged in, in a state of uh, uh, attack. I feel that this idea of gathering the, the civic and civil uh, effort and engaging with a variety of topics is very important. It's certainly very important for those of us who are on this side of the, of the podium and that have the microphone. There are a, there's one place here if, if anybody's looking for an extra chair. I will begin by telling you that I had to make a confession that I have a passion. Maybe you can call it an obsession, and that is that I can't live without dictionaries. <laughs> I have a collection in my a public, in my personal library of a, a wide array of dictionaries. 
many of which are absolutely obsolete and useless. And a few of them are contemporary, present, uh, very engaging. And those are the ones that I open most frequently. I am a devoted uh, reader of dictionaries. And I am also a critic, a critic of them and have <laughs> been on the side of making them. I want to talk to you today about all those uh, relationships that I have with the dictionaries, and what is it that we do with dictionaries, what do they do to us, how do they came to be, the varieties of dictionaries that exist across cultures, particularly across cultures. I am very interested in the differences between English language dictionaries and French language dictionaries, or Spanish, or German, or Hebrew, or Arabic. And many of the obsolete dictionaries that I have in my, in my house have to do with the fact that, uh, well, I don't know many of those languages. Still, I have the dictionaries with me. I also have entire collections of Don Quixote, uh, another passion of mine in languages, Sanskrit, uh, Korean, <laughs> that I don't understand. But I am sure the book is as good as it is in Spanish. And likewise, with 100 Years of Solitude, I have become this uh, fan of the book and have uh, collected uh, the, as many possible versions, uh, sometimes two translations within the same language as possible. One thing I don't have is translated dictionaries, because dictionaries don't get translated. Dictionaries are only uh, emerging and emergent in their own language, and for that reason they are also stuck in them. Let me tell you how my passion began. It began with my father, as many things do in my life. When I was a young man, and you might relate to this type of scene or anecdote, I would be at the lunch or dinner table talking about whatever was happening in the world or whatever was happening in my world, when I would say something that my father would suddenly hear and say, stop. You use that word improperly or incorrectly. And I would say, how do you know? <laughs> and he would say, I know because I am a friend of dictionaries. And one day you might become one yourself. <laughs> Go and look up that word. And you will find out if you have the right definition, and if so, the right usage of it. There was nothing more annoying and obnoxious than my father telling me there was, that there was this sacred text that had the truth, and nothing but the truth as if it had arrived from Mount Sinai. That whatever the dictionary would say was correct and without reasonable doubt. And thus, um, impatiently, I would go and open up the dictionary making sure, at least inside my, my heart and my mind, that my father would be wrong this time, <laughs> that I would be able to find a definition, if not in the first instance, in the second, or in the third, or in the fourth, that would be able to serve me as proof that he does, did not know the language uh, in total, complete, and that I would be able to debate it or prove him wrong. But uh, yet again, um, he was 30 or 40 years older than me. I would go to the dictionary and find out that he was right. And also find out other things, because I would stop in that second definition, or the third definition, or the fifth, and realize that words keep on changing, that words are never settled that language, by definition, is in constant change. In fact, the most constant aspect of language is that it is always changing. And that transformation is what keeps the dictionaries alive and us going to them all the time. I was born and raised in Mexico, and my first language wasn't Spanish. My first language was Yiddish. Uh, in talking to my father, at times the conversation would be in Yiddish, and he would send me to a Yiddish language dictionary. Um, and at times the conversation with him, or with some uh, classmates, or with my siblings would be in Spanish, and I would go and find out whatever the Royal Academy of the Spanish Language, the official dictionary 
of the language into which I was born would say about this word or that word. The fact that that dictionary had been printed in Madrid, <laughs> in, not in Mexico City, and the fact also that among the very first typos or mistakes that the Royal Academy had made in referring to Mexicans was that we were not Mexicanos, the, the way it is usually uh, referred to in, in Mexico were Mexicans, but Mexicenses, as if they didn't know that all of us did not use that word, was proof to me that whoever was behind those dictionaries could be wrong that they were not prophets, that they were not really connected with the divine, that there were always human aspects to the language. Uh, the, eventually, I realized that what my father was telling me was not only to look up this word or that word in this language or that language, but to realize that the dictionary is a great companion, a great friend, that it is really next to you throughout your life, either you battle against it or you embrace it as such. And that sooner or later, it is, you realize that it, it is an, a, an incredibly vast reservoir of words that you might know, but you might also not know, and they are available to you right there. Dictionaries can be very small or can be very large, and generally the dictionaries that I would look up at that time, or many of the dictionaries that I have in my personal library, tend to be this mammoth-like uh, door-stopping volumes <laughs> that contain the entire language, or at least they suggest or they propose that to us. They contain the entire language, and they make it available for whatever moment we might be able to need it. Now, stop for a second and, 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 and savor this thought, which to me is one of the most exciting about dictionaries. All the words we use at any time of the day, young and old, when, when we relate to somebody in a very formal way and when we relate to somebody in an informal way, words that sometimes surprise us and words that we think we know very well all of them are contained between these two covers, as if the language could be handled, could be uh, restrained, as if the language was really capable of fitting into a book. <laughs> of course, we know that language always jumps out of the dictionary. And the, soon, the sooner we hear a new word, we realize that it might not be yet in the dictionary that, it, that the dons or the erudites that are putting the dictionaries together might still be debating it or might be analyzing it, and that sooner or later that word might enter or might not. And so the, there are two types of dictionaries, and I'm going to talk about a number of different types. I would say the dictionaries that dream of including everything in, uh, I would call them very pretentious. Uh, arrogant, and the dictionaries that realize that they are limited, that there, there is a lot of language that is outside, and that eventually that language is going to bring, be brought in. Those are more humane, more humble, more uh, modest dictionaries that realize that the change of language is the change of their edition in that whatever new edition is going to be brought up or brought out is an edition that will need to reflect the current generation uh, in the way it speaks or it doesn't speak. For it is well known that those that are more liberal and more daring in the use of language tend to be younger. That those that are uh, young uh, are ready to invent new words are ready to challenge the syntactical and morphographic patterns that we have of the language, and that most of that creativity that eventually makes it to the dictionary comes from youth, or comes from those that are not at the center of our society, society but can be immigrants, or can be newcomers, or can be tourists that will see things anew, things for the very first time, and that will feel that the language can be more elastic can be more creative. 
Those of us who are of a certain age tend to be more conservative. We believe that the language needs to be protected, that the language need to be, needs to be passed on to the next generation. And in many ways, the creation of dictionaries is a desire to pass on what the previous generation knows so that the patterns that have been used for some time can be prolonged, can be projected into the future. And whatever the future does with them, it's, 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 it's up in the air. But there are other two types of dictionaries. And those are, uh, this distinction is one that the lexicographers use more often. There are prescriptive dictionaries, and there are descriptive dictionaries. The prescriptive dictionaries are the dictionaries that use the language insight to tell people how to speak, how to write, how to engage with the language. In contrast, the descriptive dictionaries, again, more humble, maybe more humane, are the ones that realize that you can't teach people through a dictionary, but instead the dictionary is a reflection of how people speak in what you do as a lexicographer or as a dictionary maker is nothing but reflect that change. Let me give you an example. The Dictionary of the Royal Academy of the Spanish Language is a prescriptive dictionary. It wants to establish the way the language should be spoken. The, that animosity that I felt as a young man <coughs> towards Spain for the fact that the book was published in Madrid had much to do with the fact that many of us in Latin America, 450 million people, react to the fact that 35 to 40 million people who are in Spain feel that they have the rights <laughs> and the property of the Spanish language and that the rest of us should use it in the way they want, even with an accent, sometimes incomprehensible, that they use. <laughs> it, but the fact is that in, in by doing so, the Royal Academy has been very clear in saying that there are words that they will not include because they are these are words that should not be used in the Spanish language. Meaning, only the words that they believe that should be used will be included in a prescription of how the language will be used. I know that this sounds a bit uh, dictatorial, authoritarian, but not all cultures have this vision of a democratic language that English has. Many dictionaries, dictionaries in Arabic, dictionaries in Swahili, dictionaries in Spanish, often have that prescriptive approach of using the dictionary to establish the way the language ought to be used. This means, of course, <coughs> that there are going to be many occasions in which somebody like me would find, as a young man or today, would find something in the dictionary that is not there, meaning it will not, I will not find it there. In that sense, since I was very young, I realized that the prescriptive dictionaries are really two parallel ones. The dictionary that has everything that was included in, that the academies accepted to, to insert, in them, and, and all the words that were left out. Uh, I would say that that is an imaginary dictionary, the dictionary of what was left for the rest of us to savor and to, and to, and to use. Now, the descriptive dictionaries are much more dynamic, are much more engaging. It is not surprising that English is, uh, first and foremost, a language that embraces descriptive dictionaries, the OED, the, the, the Merriam-Webster, are all dictionaries that are all the time including new words. The soon, as soon as they hear them, as soon as they see them pubulating in different places, they will consider them and eventually they will nominate them to be integrated. There's an entire process of how those words get in. And at the end of the year, there's a, always a statement that the Merriam-Webster dictionary has accepted this year between 10 and 100 words, and these are the words, and this is a result of the impetus that comes from the readers, the users, 
users, the entire population, of how we use the words and how we feel that the words should be integrated into, that, into those dictionaries. Thus, the descriptive dictionaries are mirrors or reflections or statements or testimonies of how we are using the language in the current time. If an, out, if a, if an extraterrestrial would suddenly arrive on Earth and open up magically the latest edition, either online or in print <laughs> of the Merriam-Webster, that would be the way Americans are using the language in that particular moment. And maybe that would be a tool for dialogue with uh, ETs or uh, in a science fiction like maneuver, a, 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 a mechanism for them to control us, to, to, to pull us down. Uh, and at the same time, not all descriptive dictionaries have been as benign and as democratic as I am describing. For a long time, the OED refused to include the word F-U-K-C. <laughs> that, that word has never made it up. F-U-C-K. And that is because the dons in Oxford believed that with the right spelling, <laughs> the word should not be included in there because it was, a, it was, it was nasty. It was a, a sign of low class a way of communication. And it wasn't until 1974, where after much debate, that word finally made it into the dictionary. Now, when a word makes it to a dictionary, in many ways, it, it, it is a cultural statement. Um, I think that 1974, more or less, it, is, it, it, it announces that after the 60s, about the upheaval of a new generation, the dictionaries needed to be much more flexible, much more open. And let's confess it, let's be honest, there is not, it's hard to think of a more a nervous and active and elastic word as F-U-C-K. <laughs> uh, you can use it to express admiration and annoyance. You can use it as an adjective and as a noun and as an adverb. Uh, it is incredibly, it, it can mean something. Sometimes it doesn't mean anything. It is, and it, not to include that word, it would be practically not to include 1% of all the words that are <laughs> As my father would often say, if you go to the dictionary, you will also find words that you probably are curious about, that it would be good for you to look at, that have to do with sexual parts. Are you interested in that? In sexual parts? I was 16 or 17. Or, or about women, or about, and you know, many of us do the most nerdy. Uh, do go to the dictionaries when our bodies and our minds are just discovering the world, the word, and would look at whatever part of the body in order to be amazed that, yes, it is described, uh, and, that, uh, and that it's not a figment of our imagination. Um, the most delicious aspects of dictionaries are the challenges that those that make dictionaries face in putting together a definition. Now think of this. Whoever thought of this idea of compiling a volume of the entire language that we use was either genius or absolutely mad. <laughs> we have an enormous array of possibilities in words. In those words, by putting them in a volume, we are establishing that they are our heritage. But how do we establish that heritage? Think, for example, of the word yellow. How on earth would you define the word yellow? One thing that you could do is you could say, it is not green. <laughs> or, or it is a combination of this and that. But yellow is yellow, and very often, if there is poetry in a dictionary, and I think dictionaries are full of poetry, it is in the concise, abbreviated way that a word that defies definition 
is presented to us. The word air, yellow, the word love. How do you define the word love in one sentence? Because the challenge of a dictionary maker is that the word will appear at the very beginning, followed with by a letter that will say this is a verb, or this is a noun, or this is an adjective. And then a sentence that usually doesn't run more than two lines that will state what that word means in clear, concise, direct language that will never use the word. You can't say yellow is yellow. <laughs> it can never use the word that is being defined. And it can never use a, a word in the definition that is harder than the, words, than the word that is being defined. In other words, dictionaries are meant for people to be understood. They don't want to simply show off, although to me, a dictionary is always a form of showing off. But it, is, it has to be accessible, and it has to be readily understood by others. And in that, I am always astonished by the creativity that these dictionary makers have in coming up with definitions of something that we find absolutely <coughs> mundane, like yellow, or like air, or like love. But let me stop in the word love. About maybe 15 years ago, I did an experiment with, a, with my Amherst College students. I happened to be very lucky in having multilingual diction uh, dictionaries and in having multilingual students, meaning students that come from the Francophone world, world and from the Hispanic world and from the Arabic world. And so what, what I asked them once as an assignment is to go and look up the word love in their own language, in Russian, <coughs> in German, in French, in Italian, in English, in Spanish, in Hebrew, in Chinese. And of course, the, the first reaction that one has is that the word should be defined exactly in the same way. Everybody understands the word yellow in the same way. If somebody in Moscow, or in Bogota, or in Cairo, the word yellow is the word yellow because we see the color yellow, we register it, and now we're going to define it in a particular way. But what do you do with human emotions? Human emotions that are defined by the culture in which they are experienced. Now, all of us, in one way or another, know what love is. But think, do we really know what love is? We can use the word love to describe love of oneself, self-love, love of God, love of nature, love of the world. Uh, and love of country. We can talk about romantic love. We can talk of love of parents and siblings and family in general. And we can talk of love when connected with friendship and love of one's passion, my love for dictionaries. Do I use the word love in the same way when I tell my wife, I love you, and when I say to a student, this is a wonderful paper. I love it. <laughs> is the word love really meant in the same way when a young person first discovers love and uses that word for the first time? Or when somebody 58 tells his wife, I love you. We've been married 32 years. And it is as if it was the first. Is the word different? Has the word changed? So my students went out on this quest and came back. And what, I, and what we, I, and, and them together found out was really wonderful. The fact that uh, I, have, I have asked them to look for the official dictionary of their own language, meaning the Royal Academy of the Spanish Language Dictionary, or the La Rousse Dictionary in French, or the OED, by official, I was already entering into this quagmire of who is, who represents the language, who is the authority in the language, and in what way is the OED the one that we trust 
more than somebody just coming up with a dictionary in a small publishing house in Brooklyn or in Dallas that tells the rest of the population this is the way you should use the language. So in asking them to go to the official site, I was hoping that we would get a statement of what that culture sees as, as love. And what we found out, what I found out together with them, was astonishing because in, in many ways also um, expected and almost stereotypical. The French in the Larousse Dictionary, the first definition, is one that stresses romantic love. It is about encountering somebody else that you will, you will almost be paralyzed by. <laughs> very French. <laughs> the Germans, at the very beginning, used the word love to define love of one's country. <laughs> and and it, felt, it felt in the way they delivered it that there was something almost a, a determined almost as if you don't choose that love, but that love chooses you. There were others that emphasized at the very beginning, because there were various definitions, two, three, four, love of friendship, like the Italians. Or, the, or other languages that simply talked of love or in, in, a, in a vague and open way, like a connection with things that you empathize with or that change you and transform you inside. And so my, my quest with, together with them was to try to understand if by making choices, this, the culture stresses a particular type of approach to the emotion that the language, concise as it is, in the very first definition <coughs> in the dictionary, is validating more than others, as if the stereotype that we have of the French as falling in love romantically comes already in the Labrouse dictionary in the way that the view that we have of, the Ger of Germans being exact and in, in devoted to one's nation or to one's country shows up as well. And so I wonder if when in the realm of emotions we are dealing with attempts at defining anger or envy <coughs> or jealousy. How do you distinguish the words envy and jealousy in a dictionary? Uh, do we see them not only by what they mean in terms of the language, or do we see them through the prism and the lens of the culture that we ourselves are projecting and are projected into? In that sense, you will not be uh, surprised by the fact that you could do a history of certain types, archetypes, prototypes, and stereotypes of a society by reading dictionaries across time. <laughs> Go and open up the word woman in the OED. The very first definition shows up around 1870, and it is as a companion to man. We couldn't put, in the age of the Me Too movement, we couldn't put such a definition. And the same thing goes for a pet, or goes for the is, is centrality of the male character in many of those dictionaries in the middle of the 19th century is unquestionable. And as a result, uh, most of the things that are defined are defined in relationship or in perspective to the male. And as the world has become more pluralistic, more open-ended, more, more equal, hopefully, you see that the definitions move in a variety of ways, reflecting the changes of our time. I am not only Mexican, but I am also, I grew up in a small minority in Mexico, a Jewish minority. And so the word Jew has always been one that I look for in dictionaries to see how they, how they have uh, described it. And it is another word that has always surprised me. Uh, at the very beginning, for instance, in the history of the Spanish language, the very first dictionary that we have 
coincides more or less with the writing of the second volume of Don Quixote. In 1614, uh, the first dictionary of the Spanish language is published, the Diccionario de Covarrubias, and in 1615, the second part of Don Quixote. Uh, I am telling you this because this is, Cervantes is known as the depository of our language, and so the fact that the very first dictionary was published at the same time is a statement of the language that he's using and of how the Inquisition for the very first dictionary was published under the ages of the, of the Inquisition, allowed or didn't allow certain words to be included. <coughs> Cervantes is incredibly open about the words he includes. And just like Shakespeare, <coughs> invents all sorts of words because writers have the right to invent as many words as they want. And eventually, those words make it to the dictionary <laughs> because Shakespeare invented about 2,000 lawyer being one of them, that eventually <laughs> makes it to, a, to the OED. The same thing, more or less, with Cervantes. But the very first time that, the, that a dictionary in Spanish, in 1614, uses the word Jew, is to describe somebody who engages in sat satanic uh, uh, endeavors and is a tempting demon ready to lead Christians in the wrong in the wrong path. Fortunately, that is no longer the definition that exists of a Jew in the current dictionary. But it has been a very slow process, uh, to say the least. If you go from 1614 to the current definition, there is almost, I feel, a reluctance of making the Jewish religion autonomous and legitimate and authentic. And instead, it is always the counterpart of Christianity and the one that stole or didn't steal what Christians and what Jesus did or didn't do. Um, the, the history of mistakes in dictionaries is delicious. <laughs> I mean, just as one is in awe by the words and how they are described, one is also uh, astonished by how certain words have been defined over time. Uh, the, in, in Portuguese, the, almost until very recently, the definition for day, for the, the, a day, was uh, the time that it takes the sun to circle the earth. <laughs> it wasn't until a number of Portuguese writers wrote to the dictionary makers that they finally changed the definition to the time that apparently takes the song to circle the earth. As if Galileo had not uh, come across, and uh, we were still very, you know, uh, earth centric. For a long time, in the dictionary of the Spanish language, the definition of dog was a canine that raises one back foot in order to pee. <laughs> and I think it was only in 1983, after Garcia Marquez and Borges wrote to the Royal Academy, saying that this was an embarrassment to the Spanish language, that they changed it and brought in an entirely different definition. <laughs> um, one of, the, one of the, uh, the challenges that we face today is that dictionaries are still central to our culture, but undergoing a, a rapid change. Most of us no longer go to a physical book, open it up, and see what it says or it doesn't say. Instead, we go online and we look at OED or at Merriam-Webster, type the word, and come up with a definition. It's incredibly fast, speedy, efficient, practical, but there is something that is missing there. And I might sound as a nostalgist here, <laughs> but the fact that sometimes in the middle of the night, suffering of insomnia, 
I don't have anything to do, and I, I'm not ready to, to turn around once more in my bed. I go and open a dictionary, and a word and a definition allow me to jump to another word and to another definition, back to the early part of the volume and to the middle. It is very much like the pleasure we still have in having libraries. That is, we don't have books that are delivered to us on a Kindle or on an iPad, but we can go to a library and browse around and see all the books that are next to the book that we were looking for. And by chance, we will stumble upon one that actually is the one that was waiting for us. <laughs> the book that was waiting for us that will change our life that we didn't know was there as a friend waiting. And that is what happens with dictionaries that are in printed form. There are words that are waiting for us that, that we didn't know, we don't know, we won't know until we open the dictionary and browse uh, haphazardly, accidentally, uh, in a jazzy way, and stumble upon a word that we might or might not use, but is all of a sudden a capsule telling us what the entire world looks like through that unique word, a word that, that is it's, it's unique, and, it, and it's for us. The OED, in its second edition, has a hundred, around 175,000 entries. It has 20 volumes, and those entries are of a historical nature. Because there are different types of dictionaries again. The dictionaries that are ready to offer one definition and one alone as a statement of what the current language is. And the dictionaries like the OED that want us to go back in time and see how the word has been used and often give us a quote from Milton or Shakespeare or T.S. Eliot to understand the context to understand how that word is framed and phrased. Historical dictionaries are dictionaries not only for the common use, but are dictionaries that tell us that before us, somebody has used the word yellow. And that that word might actually have been used in a different way. And here are two or three examples of how it has been used in 1895, in 1910, and in 1955. And by offering us that many of possibilities, that bouquet of, of, of quotes, we feel that the language, our language, <coughs> is really not ours. That we are but part of a chain of, of users. Many have used it before. Many will use it after us. And we are its keepers its protectors, its destroyers. We are the ones that have the language for now. At one point, somebody else will come along and carry the torch, just as we are carrying the torch from somebody who came before us. And that pushes you to understand the language in a different perspective. It is not only a way to communicate between us. It is also a way to communicate with the dead. That is what reading a classic is. You open Milton's Paradise Lost, and you are engaging with a writer that has been dead for 400 years, 300 years. And likewise, when you open a dictionary, you realize that some of these words are not going to be there in the next edition, because they will not be used in the same way. And probably, they will not be used altogether. Upon arriving as a Mexican immigrant, a bad hombre, to the United States in 1985, I thought I knew what the word bad, B-A-D, was. And uh, I was happy about it. Uh, I was slowly making English my own language. I did it by, at night, opening Moby Dick, a book that I had read in Spanish, and having a dictionary next to me. And I would read the very first line, or the very first paragraph, call me Ishmael, 
And I, whatever word I, wouldn't, I would, would not know, I would look up in the dictionary and make a little note to myself. And being a book of the 19th century, being this magisterial, epic novel of the 19th century, there were many words that I didn't know. And so I would accumulate notes in, in a hefty manner until I would realize that I was almost competing with the size and scope of Moby Dick, and that actually the object and subject of my attention was not Melville as such, but was the OED that was telling me so much of what I needed to know to understand the, this classic novel. I would turn off the light, and then I would try to remember all the words that I had just looked up, mm -hmm. and all the definitions that I had written as if to memorize them, and as if to have them in my reservoir, in my database, that word, that word was used at that time, <laughs> in order to be able to uh, use it and be a show off. This is, I was an immigrant. I wanted to use the language the way a native would use it. And the best way was to use my memory and use every intellectual equipment that I, that I had in order to make that language my own. I soon realized that there are two creative uh, forms. The creative form of the fiction writer that uses the language in a straightforward way to describe, to describe a world that his or her imagination are presenting in a kind of journalistic way, describing it as if it was existing before his or her eyes. And then there was the other creativity, the creativity of the dictionary that was allowing me to understand everything that was in this first book. And I, have, and I came to the conclusion then, a conclusion that I cherish to this day, I believe that every novel, yesterday's, today's, and tomorrow's, is already contained in the OED. The OED has to be scrambled, rearranged, <laughs> throw all the words into the air, and if you are T.S. Eliot or Maya Angelou, catch the ones that you're going to use in your poem or in your play, and then you're going to turn that dictionary into your own language, into your own statement, into your own vision. But it is already there. Whatever next David Foster Wallace, a, a genius, is going to come across in this year or in 10 years, she is going to use already the words that are contained in that dictionary. She is going to rearrange them in a way that none of us here know exactly how. And yet, when that arrangement is made, we are going to be amazed. We are going to realize that the words can have yet another way of coming together that we didn't know in existence. And that is the beauty of the language and the beauty of the dictionary as a seed, as a container of things that are present, but things that are past and things that are future as well. I told you at the very beginning that I am not only a reader and a user of dictionaries, but I am also a maker of dictionaries. And so all this critique that I have given you of, a, of the lexicographers as pretentious, it applies to me as well. <laughs> I have worked for some time uh, with a colleague at Merriam-Webster and suggested certain words and they looked at the way they, they um, use the words that come from the outside, they debate them and eventually they accept them or they don't accept them. It is a, a wonderful process and I have done a, for better or worse, a dictionary of something called Spanglish. <laughs> Spanglish is the mix of Spanish and English. It is a hybrid language. Usa un poco de español and a little bit of English to create algo that is in medio, in between, que ni es from here, ni es de allá. There are close to 60 million Latinos in the United States. 
And just like any previous immigrant group, they use the language in the best way they can, sometimes without the education that they wish they had, because they have to bake and meet and uh, provide for their children. And the result is like Yinglish, the mix of Yiddish and English that happened in the second generation, the children of the immigrant, of the Jewish immigrants, or Chinglish, the mix of Chinese or Mandarin with English, or Franglais, the mix of French and English. Spanglish is a, an incredibly a dynamic form that is taking place right now in cities like Miami and New York and Los Angeles and, and Chicago. And uh, I faced the challenge of making the very first dictionary of the Spanglish language. And I felt like a thief. And I think every dictionary maker, every lexicographer, is a thief. We are thieves because we steal from people the language that is used on the street. We codify it, we catalog it, we present it to others as authoritative. This is the way I have heard the word from Spanglish say a clica or rufo used three times. One of the laws of dictionaries is that if you are going to insert the word, the word, you have to have heard the word in three different places that are not connected with one another. The users are not connected with one another with the same meaning resulting of, of them. In other words, you can't invent the word all of a sudden and, uh, and say that, that it, is, it is legit. And so we, I, together with a group of researchers, went all across the country to harvest the Spanglish terms that are being used all over, quickly realizing that there is a Cuban way of using this new language, in a Mexican way, in a Puerto Rican way, and then an Anglo way of when we of learners of the language, in that we needed to figure out spelling. Spanglish is in the process of navigating between an oral form of communication to a written form, and a, a dictionary allows the language to feel that it has arrived, that it, that it, it is settled, that it, it has legs, it is grounded. And in doing that dictionary, many, when we published it, many colleagues thought that we had done a disservice to Hispanic culture by giving legitimacy to this hybrid that is emerging in front of our eyes and of our ears. Others, like me, felt and feel that those hybrids are what make language <coughs> interesting. And that constant transformation it often results in a language that is altogether new. Latinos in the United States don't speak Spanish. And many of us don't speak exclusively English we can speak a middle language, a middle ground, the way middle languages were spoken with different invasions by the Romans or by the French or by the Americans in different moments in history. And people needed to react to those, to those influences, to those colonial or imperial presences by adapting. One of the most confronting and defiant critiques that we faced, and I come here to the end of my talk, is it came from the purists. And they called themselves purists. They said that language needs to be pure in order to survive. And I perfectly understand this, this worldview. Of course, in the age of Trump, the word pure <laughs> it, it is, is, a, is, is very uncomfortable because it, it has supremacy components or connotations. But there is a feeling and a sense that language needs to be protected. And dictionaries are authorities the way academies are authorities, 
the way I would go to my father, and my father would say, this is the way the language is used. He was an authority. He was telling me that there is a right way of using the language, and there is a wrong way of using the language. And so I thank the purists for pushing us to protect the language. I also believe that impurity, in language in particular, is important. And so I return to the word bad <laughs> and to Michael Jackson. <laughs> I don't know if I have to say more, but having understood, I thought, what the word bad was about when I first arrived to this country and the way Melville would use it, I quickly heard the way everybody did, the, the use that Michael Jackson was doing of bad, which really meant good. <laughs> and so my bad or this is bad can be this is good. And that means that a word will fluctuate and be transformed. The word gay, the word queer, words that in Shakespeare's time could mean happy or bizarre, today might have a completely different connotation. It's not that Shakespeare is old-fashioned. Shakespeare belongs to his time, and we belong to ours. In the future, the word gay or queer or bad might be understood totally different. The way Al Gore, when accepting the nomination to be vice president, used the term information superhighway to refer to the web. The word web wasn't yet in vogue at the time. And today when I say to my students, all right, you can use the information superhighway in order to do this. They have no idea what I'm talking about. Al Gore is still alive, I think. And so am I, I think, too. The words change, and we change them, and they receive them, and they change them as well. And so bad is good, and words need to be protected, but also we need to recognize that the words change and we change with them, that we are the change that the words are caused upon, and that the words are not ours, but we are transient entities. English language was before us, and English language will be after us. We are simple and passing users of it. Dictionaries as authoritative and authoritarian as they might be, are our helpers, our providers, the receptacles of what the language is, <coughs> but we can't be paralyzed by them. They are also open to change, open to critique. <coughs> they are ours. They don't come from Mount Sinai. And eventually, somebody who is a student today just arriving to the college will become the next lexicographer mm -hmm. and will say that the way Professor Stallings was using a word was totally wrong, <laughs> that it needs to be updated in the right way, and happily so. Thank you. complaints, <laughs> anything, please. You mentioned roughly <coughs> 20 million people in this country, there are? Latinos? No, so, I, mean, I mentioned 60 million people. Sir, <coughs> so, should you please do something in that dictionary? The Latino is degrading. To bundle up the people, the Latino voters, it's, it's, it's just the obsession. I don't understand what you're saying. Can you explain? Can you develop it a little more? I mean, you, you ban all kinds of people. Latin America, the thing with. I mean, because of the colonization, the, this tragedy, they become Latin. So I myself removed you. Yeah. And I meant my Latinity to that thing, among other things. I oh, mean, OK. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, because the, 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 the <laughs> Mexico, the, the, the elite, the political elite, they're not Latinos. The Mexican, the, the Spanish descendants, 100%. They're not mixed with the, the indigenous population. OK. So I understand what you're saying. When they have this country, they become Latinos. I mean, what are you going to do about a dictionary? 
I will give you the challenge. I believe I understand what you're saying. I appreciate your, your comment. Uh, the term Latino is one that the, let the Hispanic population has chosen for itself. And uh, it uses an X uh, these days. It has gone through a variety of terms, Hispanic, Spanish speaking. There are also the Mexicans, and the Cubans, and the Puerto Ricans, and the Dominicans within that community. The rubrics that we use to define our communities can be very problematic. Uh, the term African American, black, uh, Negro at a, in a certain time. So the, th those terms are in themselves not, uh, not stable, but in constant change. Latino is a term that I use for my, to myself and for myself, and that is current today just as Hispanic was used uh, 20 years before. And uh, though I would prefer other terms, uh, there is a kind of resignation when the majority uses a term. For language um, is the rule of the majority. And if everybody, I, I found that with Spanglish, if uh, I, I might not like the fact that in Spanglish, instead of techo or roof or ceiling, the word rufo <laughs> is used. And I might teach my students to say roof or ceiling or techo. But if 60 million people are using rufo, I might make a tantrum. But, and I might say, I don't want this word in my dictionary. But then I'm going to turn it into a prescriptive dictionary, not a descriptive dictionary. So the uh, language is for the people, by the people, to the people, and uh, for better or worse. There was a question here, and then I go here. Go ahead. Sure. Well, excellent. So you mentioned Cervantes yes. and the, um, and the, uh, oh, the, the, the development, the, uh, development of a standard Spanish definitions. Are there Americans who would have had an out, uh, oversized influence, individual American writers or speakers, who have an oversized influence on uh, redefinition of words? Sure. Who? Of oh, the English language or of the in, Spanish in, language? In, in America, in the United States. Oh, there, the, there is a fascinating relationship between literature and language. There are writers that use a word uh, that uh, for the first time, and then that word eventually gets used by others or accepted in dictionaries. T.S. Eliot used words that uh, eventually made it to the OED. Shakespeare is the best example. 2,000 words he invented that eventually made it. So writers, yes, there are many American writers that have used different terms in, in, in Twain. Who is it? Twain is a perfect example of the usage, and, and a very controversial example, of the usage of terms. Uh, in uh, Huckleberry Thin, he uses the language that the child will have and the language that the slave will have. He is not black. We can debate issues of our appropriation. He is taking certain words, using them, and some of those words will eventually be used because they are being used in the text by readers making, it, making them to the dictionary. It, I think that the, 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 the consequence or the corollary of what you're saying is the tension that exists between the oral way we use the language and the written way we use the language. We can use words in, in whatever way we want, but there is a kind of tyranny of the printed word. Once a word is printed, that word has grounding, and it becomes, it becomes a, a statement of its time. And it is read by whoever it's read, and it is uh, accepted. The same thing happens with, with for, for a long time, up until the Middle Ages, contracts were a uh, handshake. Today, we need a contract that is in written form. The written way of using the language will establish that whatever agreement we have between us. The same thing goes with the uses and usage of the words in that contract or in that novel. So yes, I, I, David Foster Wallace is another wonderful example. He was an erudite of the language. In Infinite Jest, he pushes the language over the edge. He's sometimes engaged in debates with his copy editors 
who would tell him there is no such word in English, and he would say, I don't care. I want to keep that word in my novel. Who is? Who are you to tell me? The tension with copy editors that we all face is, is ah, the copy edited version of my book came in. I hide my head under the ground for two days and then come up. Yeah, it's it's. There are many American writers who have established words. Maja Angelou, uh, in Beloved, there. Plenty. It, it particularly happens in, well, in general, but ethnic <coughs> writers often feel that the language doesn't belong to them until and unless they make it their own. Mm -hmm. They adapt it to themselves. Uh, and ethnic writers can be at the forefront of making the language much more elastic and including a number of words that uh, were not accepted. So going back to Jewish and Yiddish, in, you know, words like schmuck, schmendrig, bagel, popik, eh, chutzpah, words, these words were not in the language until the Jewish immigration came in and until writers like Anzia Yezerska, eh, Abraham Kahan, Isaac Pashevi Zinger established them through the New Yorker and others as words that are legitimate. Eh, today, those words, coming from Yiddish or Hebrew are part of the English language, and you don't have to italicize them. Nobody italicizes the word mezuzah anymore. It's part of the English language. But it wasn't part of the English language 200 years ago. And the word uh, sombrero, or the word uh, taco, the same thing. Those many words that have to do with food, that have to do with emotions, and with sexual parts, uh, those words come from other languages. And fortunately, this is a good moment to, you know, not all languages have the same amount of words. <laughs> um, English is incredibly lucky in being, I, I'm gonna say something that, 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 uh, that has a controversial elements here. English, is an imperial language, a colonial language, a language that goes with beyond its constraints and inflicts itself on others. But it's a very elastic language, and so it includes words in, of those encounters, words that, that it, it harvests in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Latin America, in Russia, uh, English is open to including all those words much more than French. The, the French are always saying, we don't want more English. <laughs> the Americans are saying, we're speaking whatever we are, uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. The fact that we use the word table for a table, it's so, so arbitrary. Why don't we call the table child? We have all agreed that that word, table, is going to be connected with that object. But there is this fluidity in, in, in when you travel across languages, when you travel in the world, but when you are multilingual, you realize that it could be mesa, or it could be tabla, or it could be a variety of things, and that the words and the objects are really divorced, and it's the culture that connects them in a variety of ways. I love those aspects as well. Now, dictionaries force upon us those words in a much more um, a, you know, <coughs> direct fashion. But uh, yeah, language is, I, I love this section in a chapter two of the Bible where, um, where there is this Adam and Eve, this naming of objects. Oh, yes. And by naming the objects, the objects become your property. Uh, of course, in today's world, there is this sense of appropriation and that everything is human-centric. Uh, there's a beautiful passage in 100 Years of Solitude, a book I highly recommend, <laughs> uh, where there is an epidemic of insomnia and everybody forgets, because they haven't slept for so long, how to refer to things. This object, they don't remember that is, that is a chair. And so one of the Aurelianos suggests that they should put a little sign 
as in Montessori, that you should say chair. So every object, the cow, the egg, the chair, the mother, but then they forget what those objects are for, and then they have to add this chair, which is used for people to sit down, <laughs> egg, which is used for breakfast, blah, blah, blah. And of course, by doing that, they are already creating language. They are establishing what a dictionary does, the definition or the a description of what the world is all about. What do we use the cow for? What do we use the chair for? Always from the perspective of the user of the language. Yes? Um, I'm interested in your Spanglish dictionary. Yeah. In what language are the definitions written? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm going to answer that question, but I'm going to take a little detour. Um, you know, there are monolingual dictionaries, and I should say that uh, there is a, a, a contradiction at the heart of the American experience. We are the most powerful country in the world, the most, the one that is most shaped by immigrants, meaning every single language from every single part of the world is spoken on American territory today. And yet we have phobias for foreign languages. We believe everybody should speak English because Jesus spoke English. <laughs> and, and, so, and so, and so, and so, we 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 the, the most the most current and the most sellable dictionaries are monolingual dictionaries. The OED. It might be kind of stating the obvious, but the OED is a monolingual dictionary. It's a dictionary that gives the word in English and gives the definition in English. <laughs> there are bilingual dictionaries, and students in particular use them, tourists use them all the time. English, the word is in English, and Spanish, because it's sold in Spain, or, in, or depending on where you're using it. And so it will be how you use the language in Spanish and in English, and sometimes it will be two books in one. In, in opening in the reverse, and you will see Spanish and English and Swahili, and Swahili and English, and the definition will be in one language, and then it will be the definition in the, the other language in the other one. There are, fascinatingly, <coughs> trilingual dictionaries and multilingual dictionaries. I have some that can be a word in one language and then a definition in, in English, in French, in Portuguese, in Hebrew, etc., whatever. And, and that's extraordinary unto itself. The dictionary assumes that the world is not the way Jesus spoke it, but <laughs> there are, there's a plurality of languages. This dictionary has two editions now. So we have the dictionary that lists the word in Spanglish and gives the English language definition. And now there's a, uh, an edition of the word in Spanglish and a Spanish language definition. Mm -hmm. Both of them are bilingual dictionaries, but there's not a monolingual dictionary yet mm -hmm. of Spanglish with the Spanglish definition. <laughs> <laughs> I might be dead before that happens. <laughs> For one more question. Uh, yes. You talked about your collection of dictionaries, and you have a Swahili one. Yeah. Um, Useless, probably for me. From, 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 but do you have any other Bantu language dictionaries? Because I, I, I didn't know there was too many dictionaries of, of African languages. Oh, there are. I have about seven or eight dictionaries of African languages. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of dictionaries of a, a African slang. I particularly oh, like sure. slang. Uh, American slang, uh, African slang, uh, Spanish slang, and I have a number of them published in England, in, in India, and in Africa in different places. I have dictionaries also that are like uh, dictionaries of sexual parts <laughs> that are used throughout the Spanish speaking world, world because we in the same language, as, a, as a George Bernard Shaw would say, we speak, we're separated by the same language. Courgette. 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 And so the, we have, you, uh, the way the word will be used in Mexico 
is different to the word that will be used in Chile or in Paraguay, and they will use many other words. So this lists a, a word, it, it goes by country, and it tells you all the language, all the words that are used for the male part or whatever. Uh, I have dictionaries of a cowboy English, <laughs> a medical English, a advertising, sports. <laughs> My wife is ready to kill me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.